Pierce Brosnan, upon the recommendation of the faculty to the Board of Trustees and by its mandamus, I confer upon you the degree of Doctor in Environmental Advocacy, honoris causa, with all the rights, privileges, and distinction thereunto appertaining. In token of which, I present you with this diploma and cause you to be invested with the degree of Dickinson College appropriate to your degree. I invite you now to deliver your remarks. To President Ensign, Distinguished guests, faculty, graduates, family, and friends of Dickinson College, a huge welcome to one and all. To the Dickinson College graduating class of 2019, a hearty congratulations. You made it. You have done it. 35 years ago, I came to the shores of America, a stranger in a strange land. This country embraced me more warmly than I ever could have hoped for. It is with deepest appreciation and full-hearted pride that I accept this honorary degree from this historic college today. You have made me welcome in this country once again. I stand before you this afternoon humbled, honored, and filled with gratitude. It is a great opportunity and perhaps a greater responsibility that you have bestowed upon me. I also want to acknowledge the supremely talented journalist Karen Attia, my fellow honorary degree recipient, someone who actually knows how to take down global villains. And of course, Adrian Zecker, class of 52, who has, who has given the world some genuinely bond-worthy hotels across Asia. <laughs> and I've stayed in a few. I am privileged to be here with several of my personal heroes from the National Resource Defense Council. John Adams, Joel Reynolds, and Jacob Shear, as NRDC receives the Rose Walter Prize for Environmental Advocacy. It is an inspirational and well-earned recognition, a prize generously created to support the noblest of work. You gentlemen are courageous individuals and pioneers of the environmental movement. I hold each of you and the NRDC in the highest regard for your dedication, compassion, intellect, and tenacity in fighting to make our beautiful planet a safer and healthier home for ourselves as well as for the generations to come. It is no exaggeration to say that right now, this work is more important than ever Science, the fundamental foundation of our economic, social, and environmental progress, is under attack. Meanwhile, truth has become the inevitable casualty of unbridled power. From day one, this administration has had one priority, environmental destruction under the species banner of deregulation. A half century of hard fought and hard won victories are now at stake. But the NRDC is doing everything it can to save, starve, stave off the worst, filing a new lawsuit an average of once every nine days since January 2017. Thank you, gentlemen. Thank you for the work that you do. I'm so pleased to be with you all at Dickinson College an academic institution almost as old as our country, chartered in 1783. The college was built to provide a revolutionary education designed for a revolutionary age. It has prepared generations of students not just to lead full careers, but to be model citizens of our democracy. Graduates, I know the enormous effort and perseverance the intellect 
and strength of character that it has taken for you to get to this place. You have given of yourselves fully in both heart and mind in order to arrive at this graduation day, a day of so many emotions. So take comfort in the knowledge of what you have achieved. Your parents have no doubt championed you every step of the way, sometimes in laughter, sometimes in tears, but always with the deepest of love and affection for you and for your future. The world you face, I'd like to begin today by talking about the world as it is and end by talking about the world as it could be. I hope, graduates, that this cadence will leave you both shaken and stirred, but we'll see about that. <laughs> the world that you are venturing out, to, out into, that you will shape and make your own, is huge and harrowing. This is perhaps the most challenging period in human history. Our society is facing threats of unprecedented scope and severity. Economic inequality divides our human community. The growing gap between rich and poor is testing both our democracy and the foundational notion that through hard work, anyone can find happiness and fulfillment. Our planet too is facing threats just as sizable, just as severe, from rising sea levels to ocean acidification, from polluted cities to the loss of wildlife. Our global petroleum addiction is increasing concentrations of atmospheric carbon and driving our world toward a climate cliff. Seven billion people Seven billion people now inhabit this tiny blue marble we call home. As the future of each and every one of those peoples hangs in the balance, as the future of the Earth itself is uncertain, I hope it is not an overstatement to say, graduates, we need you to save the world. I know that all of you sitting here have faced your own challenges and that you have overcome them, all of you you would not be here today were it otherwise. I have the greatest confidence that you can tackle these global challenges with equal effectiveness. However, as someone who has saved the world a few times, or at least played someone who has, I'd like to offer you a bit of advice. If you want to save the world, you don't need to be James Bond. In fact, right now, our world doesn't need a Bond. Our world doesn't need a lone hero out to solve things solo. We need people from different disciplines and walks of life who are willing to work together, who can rely on one another, who can push forward, united. Our world doesn't need a hero who only chases adventure and glamour. We need people who have a passion and a sense of a mission. And finally, our world doesn't need a hero with a license to kill. We need people with the courage to create. Our world needs you. But, but <clears throat> while you're out there, Saving the world, you're going to need a few things to do. First, you need others on your side who, com who complete certainty. With complete certainty, I can tell you this. Wherever you're going, you won't get there alone. I certainly didn't. I grew up in Ireland on the banks of the River Boyne in County Meath. My father, Tom Brosnan, well, he left when I was an infant. It was not a good time to be a single mother. But my mother was courageous in her determination to make a better life for us both. And thus, she left the shores of Ireland to become a nurse in England. Now, of course, with such a decision came a number of years of separation and heartache. At the age of four, I went to live with my grandparents. After they passed on, 
I ended up living with a friend of the family. Eileen Riley was her name. Eileen was a saint of a woman to me. She was a classic, kind-hearted Irish woman with an apron wrapped around her full figure that was always covered in baking powder. <laughs> she baked the greatest soda bread in the history of humankind. <laughs> Eileen, dear Eileen, and her two children and I lived in a small home at number two, St. Fenian's Terrace. I lived upstairs in a room that I shared with two other lodgers. My bed was a single wrought iron bed with a horsehair mattress and a green curtain that I would draw around the bed frame for privacy. Now, I don't often tell this story, but this was my space, my tiny haven. And while, yes, there was some sadness and longing, I was truly a very happy little boy while living with Eileen. I remember how she wept the day I left her to join my mother in England. It was August 12th, 1964, the same day that Ian Fleming died. I was 11 years old. My life began again that day as I traveled alone on the plane to London with rosary beads in one hand and an empty aspirin bottle filled with holy water in the other. I was on my way to be reunited with my mother. Once there, I would go from a country school run with a heavy hand by the Christian brothers into the equally frightening English comprehensive school system. There were nearly 2,000 students at my school, all of them battling for an education. And I, the token Irish boy, fresh off the plane with a thick Irish brogue. For some reason, they could not or would not say my name, Pierce, so I was known as Irish. I wore it as an emblem of pride each and every day, trying to find my footing in this new landscape of prejudice and racism, learning words I'd never known and never wanted to know. And I got by. I learned to fight my way out with humor, and with forgiveness. I learned to assimilate. It was, in some ways, my first acting job, to be someone else. And eventually, I found people I didn't need to act for. I found friends who accepted me, brogue and all, friends who called me by my name, on my own. I had learned to survive. But through friendship, I learned to thrive. Those boys' acceptance, Eileen's generosity, my mother's sacrifice, that is what got, through, got me through my childhood. It's easy. It's easy to feel overwhelmed or daunted by the challenges facing our world. In those moments when you feel outmatched, you need people you can turn to. You need people who can support you, who can swell spirits, who can pick you up and dust you off and set you right. And once you're ready to get back into the fight, you will need people to stand by your side, people to collaborate and create with. James Bond could not take on climate change alone, but scientists and activists Policymakers and business leaders all working together. They could, they can. If we hope to heal our world, we'll need to do it together. Follow a passion and a mission. Which brings me to my second point. Each of you faces a monumental decision. You've spent your whole lives in school, studying for the next test, preparing for the next grade. Now you're finished, you've graduated. So what's next? Where are you going? Many in your position have sought the route of the flashy, exciting or adventurous. They've taken the high-powered job or the well-regarded profession, not because it's meaningful, but because they want the thrill that comes with first-class cabins, penthouse suites and swanky clothes. Well. I have worn the tuxedo, so I can tell you this. Our world doesn't need you to chase the super spy lifestyle. It needs you to find a passion and a mission. My own environmental awareness and activism 
were born out of a love of nature, a love for the ocean, and the love of a great woman, namely my wife, Keely. For more than two decades, my activism has flourished alongside hers. Together, we have focused our environmental endeavors on the oceans and marine mammal protection. We've come to appreciate, in particular, the magnificence of whales and dolphins, not just from a distance, but at very close range. We've come to understand how these majestic creatures are at risk of extinction, and we have come to know how important it is to defend them for their sake and for our own. That is our passion. That is our mission, because we recognize that without a healthy ocean, humankind has little chance of survival. So, working shoulder to shoulder with the NRDC, IFO, and others in Mexico, my wife and I helped save the last pristine breeding ground of the California gray whales at a World Heritage Site. Thank you. Thank you. A World Heritage Site called Laguna San Ignacio in Baja, California. It was a big challenge, mighty undertaking. We had to stop a plan by Mitsubishi Corporation to wrap 116 square miles of industrial development around this magical lagoon to transform this World Heritage Site into what would become the world's large, largest industrial salt factory. With the NRDC, we've also challenged the US Navy's use of low-frequency active sonar. We have led the fight to stop a liquefied natural gas terminal from being built off the coast of Oxnard and Malibu. And we've spent countless years working with Sam Labuddy advocating for dolphin-safe tuna. Now, protecting marine life may not be flashy, but it is important. Defending the environment may not be glamorous, but it is important. And for Keeley and me, it is a true passion. It is a passion to help children learn about the ABCs of environmentalism and preserve old growth trees and expose the dangerous impacts GMOs, pesticides have on our health and our food supply. So when you leave here today, I urge you to pursue something that is exacting to you as it is important to the world. Make something that matters. And which brings me to my final point, creation. We've heard this said once before. The environmental crisis we face, said renowned marine scientist Dr. Roger Payne, provide us with the most singular opportunity for greatness ever offered to any generation in any civilization. Greatness doesn't come from destruction. It comes from the courage to create, to see the opportunity we have been given, to seize it and to build the future. Nothing comes from nothing. It's all in the doing. You are the architects and the engineers of a new tomorrow. You will define every moment of every day. And like no species before us, you have the power to shape the future. One of my personal heroes, Senator, Senator Robert Kennedy said, in these times, the world demands the qualities of youth. Not a time of life, but a state of mind, a temper of the will, a quality of the imagination, a predominance of courage over timidity, of the appetite for adventure, over the love of ease. The world needs your youth. The world needs your will. It needs your imagination, your courage, your appetite for adventure. It needs your hands and your minds and your hearts. You have before you the most singular opportunity for greatness ever offered to any generation. So take it. Rise up. Save the world. Do good things with this life of yours. Work hard, play with passion and soul. We're counting on you. For what's for you won't go by you. Good luck, God bless, and thank you. <laughs>